me begin by welcoming Mr. Adrian Chadwick. Mr. Chadwick is uh, the Regional Director for British Council. British Council has been a major partner in Pakistan for all of us. Mr. Chadwick, those of us who grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s here, uh, in fact, I think all the way up to the 90s, have very fond memories of the British Council. <coughs> Uh, the younger people probably don't know you as well, but we grew up in what is known as British Council Libraries. Absolutely right. So <laughs> all of us owe a lot to the British Council Library. In fact, I met one of your uh, ministers once and I told him the difference between me and a terrorist is the British Council Library. <laughs> if I didn't have that, I would have probably been a terrorist. So I welcome you and uh, really owe you a debt of gratitude for many things that you've done in Pakistan. Can we begin the, converse, uh, the conversation with you giving some of your remarks, okay. and then we can call in the panel and begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nadim. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. There are there are many pleasures to doing the job I do. There are many times when you you uh, feel there's no better job than the job I do, and it's. When you come to a place where um, there is affection, mutual affection, a history of working together, of collaboration, of partnership, um, then that's one of those times. And when I visit Pakistan, um, when I'm here, and when I'm here in the University of um, Qaeda Azam University, when I'm with the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, and when I'm talking to people we've known for decades and worked with for decades. Um, to improve education, opportunity for young people. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to do that. So thank you, Dr. Nadim, for hosting um, today's workshop. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here and for the research we do. The, um, the British Council has, has um, I mean, we, we still have libraries, by the way. The libraries are alive and well in Pakistan, and they're the leading libraries we have in the region. And that, that connection with leaders um, is a very strong one. Another very strong area of collaboration and connection over many years is higher education. And in Pakistan, in particular, our collaboration with the university sector, um, with institutes such as PAID, and with the Higher Education Commission um, is exemplary. I had a very useful meeting yesterday with the Higher Education Commission, and I relayed to them that the British Council globally and the UK higher education system sees our collaboration with the Higher Education Commission in Pakistan as a model of how two countries can frame and develop mutually beneficial work. And the work we've done with the Higher Education Commission and with distinguished professors and with the universities, uh, the scale is impressive. So something like 80%, so currently 156 universities in Pakistan are taking part in one way or another in some of the collaboration and some of the links we do. And that Higher Education Commission um, collaboration and partnership with the university sector covers all of the important <coughs> areas, whether it's quality assurance, whether it's research, whether it's institutional links, whether it's new programs. We're working right away across the system, system to system, to continue those higher education links which have delivered so much to both countries. And I would really emphasize that point, that the UK benefits and gains from these research collaborations as much as, as Pakistan does. And I think just by closing, um, all countries today are looking to, uh, to understand and to respond to some of the global challenges, whether that's the global challenge of employability, giving your young men and women the skills um, to themselves make a contribution to their society um, and the development of their community and their country, whether it's to respond to external changes, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, robotics, changes in the labor markets, whether it's to respond to some of the global challenges around renewable energy and climate and water. All of this is underpinned and driven by universities and by research and by young researchers. And all of this research today is collaborative and international. 
whether we're looking at the top UK universities um, or whether we're looking anywhere in the world. So the work that we do is important in its own right, academically, but it's equally important in enabling countries to understand and manage and respond to opportunities as the world around us changes. So there could be no better thing for us to be doing together. Um, thank you again for hosting us, Dr. Nadeem Al-Haq. Thank you, Higher Education Commission and all the researchers and panelists and students in the room for working with us. And um, I wish you all a very successful um, panel discussion and look forward to hearing how it goes. Thank you. Well, folks, um, Mr. Chadwick, thank you very much for supporting this research and for supporting Pakistani universities. British Council is now a major partner uh, for, for HEC, I think, right? Major partner for HEC, where they are linking us up with, or uh, Pakistani universities up with uh, British universities to support research in Pakistan. And I guess this is a crowd that is kind of committed to research, so I don't have to sing praises of research here. They all believe in research, at least I hope you do. But if you don't, then we are in deep trouble. <laughs> so I think uh, if whatever I say about research here will obviously receive a lot of applause, so I won't say much. But uh, or let me also welcome our British Council team, because as I said, they've all helped us. Mr. Amir, um, Mr. Amir um, um, Ramzan. Mr. Amir Ramzan is a Pakistan country director. Amir Sahib, would you like to come up and say a few words just so people get to know you and know how to greet you when they see you cycling in uh, Islamabad? Because apparently he's a cyclist. Now, I hope many people here also take up cycling following Amir, right? Yeah, um, good morning everyone. Um, please don't greet me when I'm cycling because I'm just trying to catch my breath. <laughs> so um, giving a response might be a little bit of a challenge. As it was this morning when I took Adrian for a walk up Trail 5. And he's a rather fast walker, so I got kind of out of breath. But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm the relatively newly arrived country director in Pakistan. I've been here for five months. Um, it's a real honor um, to be working in Pakistan for the British Council. And the honor is because of the excellent partnership we have with the various <coughs> organizations and institutions in Pakistan, the Higher Education Commission, the universities. Um, our passion is to work with you and supporting you and Pakistan in its journey to help its students, researchers, academics develop so the quality of education improves in Pakistan and um, so all the opportunities can come from that. So that, will, that has been our mission, that is our passion and that will continue. And um, I look forward to seeing you again, maybe when I'm not cycling, but I look forward to meeting you again <laughs> and being able to talk with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And from British Council, I would also request Nishat Riaz, who is the champion for education in Pakistan, and she's done a lot, and she helped us get into this. So I think, Nishat, we would like some words from you. Assalamu alaikum, subah bakhair, and a very happy Wednesday. Rock Sahib, you have your own ways of surprising us. Um, this is a lovely surprise, but it's full of brightness, it's full of energy, it's full of content, and it's full of wisdom which is filled in this room because it's the power of the best of Pakistan here. Kaidazam University used to be the best institute every student aspired to be in. So I think we are proud to be here as British Council. Not once on this occasion, but we are proud and honored to work with the Kaidazam University, with you all, with your researchers, and with the faculty and with Dr. Saab and his team around flourishing the culture of research itself. The country that we live in is one of the populous countries in the world, fifth or sixth populous country in the world. And it has a lot of geographic power because of its strategic location that it is. And how researchers make it more relevant to bring positive contribution in the lives of the people that we have, especially young people, 65% of the population of Pakistan is young people. And the research that is developed, the research that is designed, the research that is conceived, and the research that is applicable in this landscape is of huge importance and relevance. And we are proud and honored 
to build the capacity of the researchers. We have worked with Kaidasam University, and Sarah will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we worked with 900 researchers from within this university to help improve the culture of research on the application of research. So again, proud and honored to be in this institution. It's always great with the, the warmth we get, the trusted relationship that we get. And as Amin said, British Council is an honor. And thank you for making us partners in this journey. We are really humbled, we are honored, and we look forward to continuing this relationship throughout our generations. 72 years have been uh, the part of the relationship that we are in Pakistan and British Council. We look forward to many decades of relationship through the strength of the people like yourself, through the strength of the people like leaders, uh, like Dr. Sahib and the rector and the deans. Um, that you so again, thank you so very much. Uh, we look forward to working with you. Our research goes in the rakhna hai, and one slogan that we always have to impact factor to impact. Let's bring positive impact in the lives of the world. And of course, our partner locally is Sarah Pervez. She has made this event possible. She's made everything possible. Always be there like a rock. So Sarah, please. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab, to give me this opportunity to speak. I consider myself as a very naive individual in this August gathering of such good academics from PIDE. Uh, just to elaborate, um, Nishad Kaidazam University and PIDE were together, but now, mashallah, PIDE has received its own university. It is now a university of our body. And we are now at Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, which was set up as a hub for research for, uh, for our country. The research that has actually contributed a lot to the policy making in Pakistan. Um, so it, it is another privilege for us that now Dr. Nadeem ul Haq has become the Vice Chancellor, which is an added bonus uh, to work with this institution. And I think that um, the time that I've invested in the higher education sector in, in, in order to make improvements in the research culture of Pakistan, uh, there are lots of things that have been covered in this research publication that you all will uh, have a copy of today, um, which is a little more, you know, sort of a criticism, uh, but I still do have all the hopes that all the people who are very ambitious, ambitious and are keen to improve the systems in this country will definitely work together with us to improve all these problems that we have seen in the research system. And inshallah, very soon, we will become a driving policy through the higher education research going on in our universities. And um, the role of British Council will be really to connect you with the best researchers of not only UK, but with other countries, to connect you with the right people from the UK policy makers uh, to the UK research community, to the international research community. And just recently, we received a request from the Speaker of National Assembly that they are looking for research experts to help them, help their standing committees on education, to drive them uh, and help them with research so that they can back their policies through those research and evidences. Uh, so I think this is now time when people are ready to, to have that sort of research um, from our university sector. Now it's our responsibility, it's the responsibility of the university research community, the academic community, to put in all the efforts to make that research as not impact factor one, as Nishad said, but the impact research. So I think that's all I would like to say at this stage, and then we will be having a further discussion in the panel, so look forward to be part of that discussion. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, once again, thank you, British Council, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chadwick, for being here. And, uh, you know, I hope from, from Delhi, because uh, I think Islamabad has much to offer compared to Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Trail 5. You can't get there in Delhi, yeah? So it's not the excitement. Of Delhi? Uh, yeah, I don't think we want that excitement. So let's begin with the program. Let me welcome Mr. Zainul Abedin. Mr. Zainul Abedin is the Director General of Zansa with the Director General of Research and Development in the HEC. Uh, are you leaving? Okay. No problem. Okay. 
to improve these uh, sector, university to university sector linkages between UK and Pakistan. This has got eight, seven, eight components, and all these components cover lots of a higher education related programs. But within those seven components, the biggest component consists of the research program that we are doing in partnership with the HEC. So, um, and uh, the research program um, includes the research grants, innovative and collaborative. Announced these collaborative grants in partnership with HEC, and these are part of the national research that HEC has established. Um, th there is the uh, designing of these research grants from our previous models. Uh, we have developed lots of strategic linkages. We now want that this research is taken up by the policymakers. So we are, a lot of our focus is on non-university and you know um, using that research for the socio-economic growth of the country in different fields of life. So there are different thematic areas which we identified with the help of HEC and uh, within those thematic areas we gave out these research grants. Um, so Pakistan, under Pakistan UK Education Gateway, we also did this university, um, uh, this research on the university research systems in Pakistan and, uh, and, and the ambition was to identify those gaps and challenges which are really uh, important um, and have been probably hindering our performance or um, or, 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 they, or, or identify those areas where we can do some sort of interesting, um, you know, sort of collaborations. And, and I'm very pleased to say that Dr. Nadeem al <laughs> was one of the key authors um, um, and was part and was leading the research team who did this research. So Dr. very shortly will share the key recommendations and key findings of this research report. So I think I'll stop here and I would request Dr. Nadeem al to share the key findings of research and then we will move on to uh, some questions that will come across uh, later on. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. Uh, folks, you heard me all talk about research and all of you, we discuss it all day. So this is a very good chance to reflect on research and we've got General Abhijit Saab here and two major uh, professors, so it's well worth just taking this discussion forward. The research that I did was uh, with uh, Mehboob Mahmood. Mehboob is now going to teach a course here in Hack Tech with me. So he's a very good guy, entrepreneur plus researcher, etc. So we went to a large number of universities. In order to do this, we have to talk to a lot of people. So we went to a large number of universities, talked to a lot of people. We did online surveys, etc. So I won't go into details of that. The point was to get an idea, and as you know, how does research add up? What does research do? And many of you share this passion. So, um, and Jan Saab is here. So, Sarah, the report was never meant to be critical, and it's not critical. <laughs> but it's an assessment. It's an assessment, and it's a shared assessment. Um, we presented to Tari Banuri too, and Jan Saab, mashallah, he says he's read it too, so it's heartening. And I'm very grateful for him, for him to have read it. The key points I want to make and leave the rest for the panel discussion is that A, yes, the glass is half full, not <coughs> half empty. There is research in the system. That's very good. HEC has succeeded in creating research. Yes, there are publications coming out. But as I think uh, Nishad said, we need to move from impact factor to impact. I think that's a very good way to put it. If I had thought of it, we should have put it on the front cover. We have to move from impact factor to impact. Very good, very good statement. The problem is that people are focusing on publications as an event, not publications as a part of a research conversation, and not publications for impact. I went to UAT and I asked them, hey, there's a metro in front of you. Have you done any research on the metro? Metro's passed research on the metro. So that's a huge problem. But let me come to the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that the university system is too centralized. It has to be decentralized. The second problem is, I mean, you know, the problem, uh, you also try and think about it, news is always a problem. Good news is never news. So that's why we are focusing on problem. We are not focusing on the good news. The good news is, yes, there are 200 universities in Pakistan, publications. Yes, there are impact factor journals. The problem is that in the universities, there are no professors. As far as I can say, that time when you surveyed, this is percent professors. And HEC has now we've got a large number of PhDs sitting here, 
But a PhD, to my mind, is only a beginning, as I was telling you, Zahansab, that when I got my PhD, I was shown to the basement, and I was given an office with two people sitting in an office. So that's, it is a beginning, it is not an end. In Pakistan, it's become an end. Uh, so that's a big, big problem. We are, we are focusing on sending out people for PhDs, that sort of thing. Journal publications have gone up dramatically. In fact, the curve is U-shaped in, uh, I mean, context, so it's very good that it's happening. But there's too, much, too little money for research. I mean, money for research, HEC has too little money. HEC has like, I think it should be five to seven billion. How much do you have now? Actually, I mean, no. I can share the number. Oh, okay, fair enough. No. So HEC has too little money, and the rest of the government has zero money. I mean, HEC, the planning commission, the rest of the government has no money for research. In fact, uh, secretaries and people, and they said, no, we can't pay you even in terms of 100,000 rupees, leave alone growth. So, you know, how do you fund research? That's a big problem. The only funding that comes has a large amount of funding, but donors prefer their own firm. They don't prefer us, so that's the In HEC funding, there's another problem. Social science doesn't count. <laughs> Social science is only 3% of HEC funding. So right now in the challenge fund, for example, it, they counted that how many NRPU projects do you get, but we don't get any because there's no funding for it. So, so we got discriminated, but doesn't matter. That's besides the point. But HEC has very little funding because HEC traditionally had a bias against social science, and it's historical. But we compared R and D less than uh, GDP in R and D. Uh, China has built up R and D, and that's an important thing. Most countries now, this is an R and D driven society. Most country has to have R and D, but unfortunately we don't. We jump the gun by putting too much pressure on commercialization. Commercialization follows once you have research. I think we're trying to to commercialization, and that doesn't happen um, in any case. So that's that's a huge problem. Now um, there is there's also on the other side. Let's also look at it. This is the supply of research. Demand for research is almost non-existent. The government certainly demands no research. <coughs> industry also demands very little research because our industry is not research driven; it is SRO driven. So given that, industry also demands very little research. So there is only one demand, and that's from donors. And donors have a very restricted demand because they've got restricted agendas. So in the larger research, for example, local governments, there's very little research for that. Uh, public policy, there's hardly any research funding for that at all. And uh, you know we try and fund science, but science research funding, because there's no industry, it doesn't really go anywhere. So that's a big, big problem. We keep thinking that our industry should be mended with universities, but somehow it's not happening. Second thing is that the, the, in the research system, to give the impact factor system. I mean, there's people who are publishing 900 journal articles in, uh, a year. Some are publishing 300, some are this. So the reason you don't get it from impact factor to impact, because the impact factor also is kind of now you know, like all human systems, human beings learn how to game systems. So we've learned how to game the system, so it doesn't mean much. Um, and then the problem is that if you really, um, then some, for us in public policy, for example, if, if I find very, if I do very good, like this thing, for example, if I do very good research in Pakistan, it's not going to be published in international journals. They don't value the research at all. They value research on their own systems, or some fundamental theoretical research, which we are incapable of doing, which we can't do, because we don't have the similar background. So I think that's a big, big problem. We have to think about it. And then the most last thing that I would say, which is very important, is uh, you know, the two, three th things I want to say. When we looked at our research agenda, we found there were many, many missing themes that confront us, but not the rest of the world. For example, energy. And there are hardly any papers on energy in the, in the system. So many universities ask them about energy. The papers that they told me, yes, we have something, there's an energy uh, center for excellence too. But those are all things that don't matter to us. I mean, you know, hey, nobody knows about what's happening in Pakistan. They're doing energy work that may be applicable. Water, law and justice, all these issues are missing. These are our local problems. These are problems, if you research on them, you won't get published overseas. So there's no incentive. So all these guys come to me, they don't want to work on these things. They want to pick up a data set and they want to do heavy regressions and publish them overseas. So the regression comes out with this, for example, result, which is, it gets published. Don't get me wrong. For example, famous Asim Khaja has published a wonderful piece in QJE and AIR. And all it says is bonuses work.
So I, I did a podcast with him and interview and I said, hey, are you telling me all we need to do is people forgive people bonuses? Did you forget the 2008 crisis was caused by bonuses? Did you forget that the sheriff of Nottingham was also on a bonus scheme? So for you to tell me bonuses without historical context, but the paper got published very well. And I have said, as far as I am concerned, the paper is totally useless for us. What big issue there that we have to think about? But the other big, major thing that we have to think about is that we do research. All of you have attended the HEC conferences. I have gone to these conferences. People get money from HEC who hold a conference. But when I go there, I would have wrote about it once. It was very disappointing because, you know, hey, they're back panels and they absolutely conference goes nowhere. And there's no theme. So you move from conference to conference and there's a pressure to get somebody from overseas. And most of the people that they get from overseas are not the best people. They are <coughs> pretty poor. So the conference has become more of a tamasha. But the more important thing is there are no seminars, there are no memes, there are no debates, there are no working papers, there are no op-eds, there are no, you know, experts. So all we've got on TV is senior tajia cards. Not, none of our faculty members get called on TV, only senior tajia cards. Because, hey, we are so disconnected from our society. So that's a big problem. So I think one thing that we've learned is that we also talk to people and they tell, tell us that they have a huge teaching commitment. They have no time for research, right? Why do we have so much teaching commitment when we've got videos? So this, this has to be thought through. And most of the people are doing research only because they want to affect their careers, not because they're solving, solving a problem. So the key things are, which you talked about, Jan Sab also is an entrepreneur. He's got a startup. He's got a few startups, etc. So he does this thing. He's from Sweden, so he's done a lot of startup work, etc. One thing that these guys, terminology that these guys use that I love, is that they're looking for solutions. Are you people looking for solutions? Are you looking for a publication? And I think that's the change of mindset that we need. We need solutions from our research system. We don't need just publications. So I'll end there and I'll open it up. Uh, sorry, give it back to Sarah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Saab. Um, very valuable input. And I think it will now be relevant for Zen, Dr. Zen to shed some light mm -hmm. on the revised HEC framework and what we want to get out of the research investment that HEC is making in this country. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dimala. So, first of all, I am really humbled to be in this August gathering, actually. Um, I feel that uh, I'm not uh, enough have the experience of the academic culture in Pakistan, actually, but I can still relate some of my experiences that I've learned during the last seven or eight months that I've been uh, in at HEC, actually. So, uh, before I go into the details, I can just highlight some of the key aspects for the overall education sector. So we, uh, if, uh, if you look at our three major objectives, so it's the access, quality, and relevance of our education system. And we have three instruments in order to implement these three agenda items. Uh, we have uh, regulatory mechanisms, we have funding, and we have capacity building initiatives, actually. So in the past uh, 17 or 18 years, we have focused mostly on the excess of the, uh, increasing the access of our education system in Pakistan actually. And now uh, what we would like to focus in the next few years is to ensure the quality of that education system and also the relevance of that education system. And specifically if, we, if I talk about the research that we are, uh, research system that we are working on, we are right now focusing on uh, all of the initiatives that it should solve some of our problems, actually. So if I relate to, uh, with you some of the recent uh, the grant framework that we have developed, actually, uh, so it has four major components. Uh, one, on one side is applied research, and then we have the strategic and targeted research, actually. So we have our traditional program, national research program for universities, which has been ongoing for the last 17 years actually. And just to give you uh, figures, we have spent only 10 billion rupees in the last 17 years within this program. And we have uh, funded more than 3,000 projects within NRPU. So if you count uh, on average, each project is around two to three, three million rupees uh, for a period of three years duration actually. So 
roughly 1 million per year in Libya funding for each project. And you shouldn't expect wonders from that level of funding. Um, and then we have some new uh, grant initiatives that we have from British Council as well as some of our donors like World Bank actually that uh, has been gracious enough to give us some uh, loan actually and but uh, loan to the government but uh, for us it's a grant actually and we have opened up uh, three new initiatives around that actually the first one we call Grand Challenge Fund and there we are mostly uh, looking into uh, solving the challenges at our national level so the Grand Challenge Fund is mostly oriented towards problems related to the energy sector, related to water, water management, climate related challenges, innovative governance and reforms, um, our IT related initiatives actually. So all of these things we have actually put it as a major themes that we would like our researchers to work on actually and to solve, to present solutions to those problems. And if you uh, um, see uh, all uh, um, basic thread that is running in all of our research grant programs, we are promoting multi-dimensional research, actually multi-sectoral research, you can say. Actually. We are promoting uh, uh, collaborative research, so we would like that in most of our th these bigger opportunities, uh, we want that our academics should collaborate with each other at the national level and also at international level. So we have some programs, uh, bilateral programs, we, where it is mandatory to have international partner from the corresponding um, uh, country actually. But in all of our other programs, we are also encouraging our researchers to collaborate, to seek collaboration from international partner. And then you can even build some level of uh, funding for that. Uh, as well. We are also um, uh, encouraging our researchers to think about uh, these uh, challenges in terms of uh, what level of, what kind of uh, impact it will produce on our society in, in terms of our socio-economical level. So the GCF fund is more looking towards our national level challenges. Then we have a couple of other programs uh, the next one we uh, we have called local challenge fund, and there we are targeting uh, problems that each of our district is facing, actually, and specifically linked to the uh, sustainable development goals of the UN, actually. So, what we would uh, like our academics situated within those districts, actually, that they should. Uh, first identify those problems uh, by taking uh, the district level government on board and then present our solutions to those problems and we will be able to fund that. And uh, again, we are open for collaborations from private sector, from civil society and other public sector organizations as well. The third program that we are going to launch is actually uh, linked to promoting industry at Dinia Dixies. And that uh, by uh, we mean that it's uh, called technology transfer support fund. So it's not uh, intended for uh, idea conception actually. Rather, it is focused on the technology readiness level between five to eight, where you already have an idea conceived in your research group, and now you would like to transfer that to the industry. Actually. So we would like to fund that part of a, a research initiative actually. And in order to ensure that the industry really has a commitment and really is backing that idea, we would like to have a matching funding from the industry, which could be either in cash or in kindness. So it's not mandatory that the industry will put money into it, but we, we would like to see a commitment from the industry that they are really backing that idea. So whatever funding we are going to provide to the academic sector, we would like the industry to have the same level of matching funding. So these are all the programs that we are, uh, some of them are already launched and some of them are going to be launched in the next few weeks actually. But in addition to that, I would also like to mention that there are other initiatives that we are also take, undertaking uh, at HEC actually. So uh, we are talking with other countries as well in order to 
open up new research grant opportunities uh, for our academic sector. So recently we visited Germany actually, and we were very much appreciated there actually by the, uh, the counterpart funding agencies there actually, and hopefully within a year's time we will open up some opportunities uh, for you there as well actually. Uh, we are also thinking about uh, building some kind of triangular, triangular relationship actually, so that uh, it's not only that our researchers are only working on problems related to our own area actually, uh, I mean to our own country, but they can also use some of their experiences to solve some of the problems in the, our neighboring countries, maybe Afghanistan, maybe Bangladesh, maybe some other African countries as well. So we would like to have some kind of a uh, triangular relationship with our international donors so that uh, we can actually use the funding that is available from you in order to build relationship with uh, other foreign countries as well. And uh, we are uh, right now discussing uh, those areas of uh, our cooperation with our international donors as well. We have also actually taken an initiative uh, which we call National Research Agenda actually, uh, where we have identified uh, major areas uh, uh, that we think are important for our future maybe in the 10 to 20 years down the road actually. So we have identified 23 to 25 major areas there actually and now we are working with different ministries so that we take them on board uh, and they should actually come up with a problem statement related to their own domain and then we would like our academics to work with them to solve those problems. And that, that's the kind of a work, of, work on progress and it will be a consultative process where we will involve, of course, uh, our academics from Pied and other universities as well so that they could help us in formulating those problems. Um, and then in, in addition to that, we are also undertaking initiatives where we are involving the experts actually. So uh, uh, I could also relate that we have already formed our scientific review panels who will be actually involved in assessing all of our grants system. So it, they will be the ones who will be making the final decision about each grant application actually. We will only be implementing their decisions actually. And they will also be helping us in our future uh, policy making as well actually and in also identifying these major research themes for our future grants and also our ongoing grants as well actually. So we will have uh, all of our um, scientific input actually coming from these scientific research panels and they, we have identified eight broader domains of knowledge actually which covers almost all the landscape of the, the and uh, uh, just to relate with and economic, uh, economics, arts and humanities, uh, management sciences, they are the three major domains there actually. So they are well represented there actually. And we, we would like our researchers to actually not only work in, in their own discipline but to talk to the relative, relevant person across the dis disciplines as well actually, and to present us a holistic solution in, uh, in their research applications. Thank you so much Dr. Zan. Um, I think I don't need the mic but just <laughs> because of the discussion being... Um, I, um, the very valuable points and I'd uh, come back to you with a few questions that I have here. Uh, but I think before that I'd like to uh, give um, um, get some views from uh, Dr. Idris Khwaja, who is from Air University, currently working with Air University. So, currently working with Air University as Dean for School of Management, uh, but has been an, um, associated with PIDE as an associate professor. Um, so, Dr. Sahib, your point of view from the academic side. Uh, to the research systems in our, in our country. Thank you, Dr. Nadeem for inviting me to my alma mater. And my place of employment, and it's good to see so many familiar faces after a long time. Now, coming to the <coughs> book, I cannot help but agree with most of the points raised in the book. 
the main problem uh, that began over the last um, decade or so is that the incentive system for promotions has played sort of a havoc with research. And people have, as you have pointed out in the book, that people are gaming the system because of the number game. But perhaps uh, to an extent this is related to the number game, but to an extent this is also related with the way the institutions are using this criteria. Actually what is basically an eligibility criteria from abortions is being treated as the maximum criteria. Whether it is 8 publications or 12 publications, basically that is the eligibility criteria. And then the, it is for the institutions to see other things whether or not the candidate is filling, fulfilling those things. So if you have to move from impact factor to impact, then it is for the institutions to see whether the research is making an impact and what kind of research. And it could be through peer reviews and it could be through selection board, etc. Of course, there would be some subjectivity in the process, but then we have to live with it if we have to create an impact for research. The next is that <clears throat> uh, as Dr. Huck has mentioned in the report, there has to be a debate around the tertiary education itself. Research is basically generated in universities and it is the PhD scholars and the professors who generate research. So what kind of, uh, what is the mechanism for the PhDs here in Pakistan? In West, uh, PhDs are mostly, PhD education is mostly funded. The university might be getting money, but the student is often funded by one or the other agency. Here, the student is himself paying for his PhD in most of the cases. So, if he is doing a full-time PhD, then you won't see him after the coursework. He would just vanish and he would be on the job. So, he is not a full-time researcher, then you can expect what quality of research he would be producing. <coughs> And then number of universities are doing part-time PhD. Number of universities are running PhD programs in the evening. And that would be rare around the world. It would be only in Pakistan that the PhD program is part-time PhD. So then you cannot expect quality research from this. So if you want quality research, then we have to look at whether we can, whether we can or we cannot fund the PhD programs of the PhD students. Next, coming to re uh, demand for research, as far as the demand <coughs> for research from the industry is concerned, it has to be related with the stage of development. If you are establishing sugar mills and flour mills, then sugar mills and flour mills would not perhaps need as much research as a high-tech industry would need. So, since we are at a uh, relatively low in the stage of development, so this is but natural that the demand of industry for the research would be rather low. But still, it is the job of the academia to develop liaison with the industry and to convince them that we can do this, this for you. But again, the Academia is not going to the industry, so industry-academia linkages have to be much stronger than these are now. <coughs> Second, Dr. Huck mentions that, uh, just a side point, that uh, probably uh, Oryx need to be more strengthened. The book acknowledges that currently the Oryx are playing only a functional role, gathering data about what research, etc. is being produced. And the suggestion is that the ORIC and the QEC may be much. I think this would be a bit optimistic to expect that ORIC and QEC would be would play the role of furthering research. ORIC, as you know, are currently functional, and QECs are sort of now into more like audit of the academic programs rather than research. So it would be very difficult to reorient. Finally, one point I, I have to say that basically research, expand, and the book talks about expenditure on research, that the expenditure on research is low. It's not just, just that the expenditure on research is low, expenditure on education is low and expenditure on higher education is low. 
but uh, since this expenditure has to come from public funding, I am a bit confused about this, and maybe Dr. Hatt can eliminate us about this. If there is a trade-off between, say, letting, putting out-of-school out of children in school and expanding, making more expenditure on research, what should be our priority? Perhaps, uh, I don't have an answer for this, but maybe Dr. Hatt can tell us something about this. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Idris, and uh, you've raised some very valuable uh, insight. Um, uh, so we move on to our final speaker, last but not the least, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Zahir Raskar, who is Director, School of Economics from Kaidi Azam University, the sister university. Uh, Dr. your um, uh, your ideas on what the research system in Pakistan is doing to support or not support the university's mm -hmm. research. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sitting here on behalf of my vice chancellor, but views will be my own. Okay, and uh, I'll I'll be uh, very brief for uh, on a couple of points. First of all, basically we had to. Uh, go for inverted thinking. Unfortunately, academia all over the world is just like this tissue paper box and globe is this whole room. All regress, all questions, all solutions are based here, solved here, and we are trying to impose these solutions over this whole globe. We have to come the other way around. That is missing altogether. HEC has taken the job of thinking for us and we are bound to do that. We have to, we have to probably rethink about this as well. Otherwise, we will put all the rigor here because this has been uh, directed by the regulatory authority and we will try to propose solutions here, raise questions here, uh, irrespective of what the real uh, world challenges are. This challenge is uh, prevalent at the global level, in general, but in Pakistan in particular. So we have to rethink particularly with reference to social sciences. I don't know much about natural and biological sciences, but with reference to social sciences. Uh, so we have to think about this. Then, universities' program design should be cluster specific. Why do we think the same job by a university in Las Bela that Kaida University should also do? So we have to, for example, Karachi has banking, pharma, and these type of industries. So Karachi University's program should be designed accordingly. Unfortunately, we are trying to fit one size for all. A person who is sitting here morning till evening can supervise five students. A person who is uh, just MPhil can supervise seven MPhil students at a private university. If uh, uh, so, these, these type of things we have to rethink if we really want to promote research and big thinking. For big thinking, particularly in social sciences, we have to come out of this paper dilemma. You see, my student is not asking, sir, tell me a problem. Sir, I want to write a paper. Sir, my 10 paper is full. My 2 paper is full. So we are working for papers. We are not working for finding solution of a problem. So we have to, we have to think about this. Many things, Auric, I uh, uh, agree with uh, Dr. Idris. We are doing Auric. A grade 20%, for example, I am in charge of Auric. I have never ever been to industry. There must be or if people who are hired part-time from industry, from uh, 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 who are practitioners, they should be hired part-time. They should develop liaison between universities and the uh, industry. But having said all this, it's highly naive thinking to uh, con uh, convert research immediately into commercialization. If we go back, it's a long story. First industrial revolution, second industrial revolution, Third worldwide uh, industrial uh, worldwide web industrial revolution 70s 80s 
basically it took decades before uh, uh, they got their uh, real benefits. But we want that today we have uh, uh, education secretary was asking uh, in a meeting uh, uh, last week. So you have papers last year. What was their uh, technological in impact? So that that will not uh, take place immediately, or it need to be revised. Otherwise, it will be just be a, a, a BPS 20 and 19 and 18 jobs. Uh, uh, no 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 other role uh, they can play. Then. <coughs> We have, we are in a trap of mediocrity. Yes, I, I impact and basically research and research which <coughs> matters are two different things. Unfortunately, we have mixed it. We have all together developed a market for lemons. I have ten papers. Another guy uh, has very top notch. You see three good papers, but since I have ten, I qualify. He or she cannot qualify. <coughs> So we have to come out of this mediocrity, and for that we need IUC stars, star performers. I wish if Pied, uh, Mahmoud Sahib is sitting here when they were compiling this report, I have little liaison with them. Okay, I wish that if we have four, five top-notch scholars who visit PIDE for a month or two, and they deliver their lectures to our uh, students rather than just just the way we are going. That will have more impact. So, uh, QAU, PAD, for example, if you are going to have program with reference to economic development, then PAD must be preferred over other institutions. But we, we, are, we are dealing all with this, uh, 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 you see we are using the same yardstick for all. Uh, we need joint, I, I mentioned that we need star performance, we need joints. Unfortunately, we don't have those joint mentors in our culture now. We, uh, particularly public sector universities, I don't uh, comment on private sector universities. Then, last. HEC, <coughs> when developed, and thank, uh, 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 I'm thankful to my mentors, my teachers here at PIDE, or late A.R. Kamal, Nadeem Ulhaq, and other people, that they, they used to challenge that policy at that time as well. This theory of linear sorting, it was assumed that as number of papers will increase, knowledge will increase. We haven't, yes, research and development go together, but what type of research and development go together, we fail to differentiate. Today, our top-notch social science scholar and a very immediately graduated PhD scholar from chemistry, right? He is far superior, he is getting all the benefits, whereas my research scholar is, you see, uh, considered as a low-rated. How many Tamuga in Shane, Intiaz and all those to social sciences, right? This, these are the, basically, when we confuse data and metric, dandelions with flowers are confused. We have to jadi bootiyan aur flowers mein hame is fark hi nahi nazar aa raha na we have to isme hcc ka hai mera we are all responsible for that we all have to play a role for that so until and unless we go for these things we we rethink about these things i, I think we we have to uh, face the same uh, you see fate and particularly 21st century challenges are far complex than 1980s, 1970s, and for that we really need very trained human capital. We need high quality graduates. At the same time, we need research. High quality graduates will lead, produce good research. But unfortunately, current metrics ask me to produce research, but not high quality graduates. So our this uh, uh, shift in focus basically has. Uh, you see many serious repercussions for the whole research system and uh, probably I am not uh, taking much time. So these are my views and I have read this report, uh, this book uh, a year ago but uh, and it's very comprehensive one and professors have to come out of their silos, they have to go outside, they have to develop liaison and all that, right? I am not uh, at the moment going in this uh, detail. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Zahid has touched upon some very sensitive areas, Dr. Nadeem, and I would like to uh, 
um, have your viewpoint and now your hat as a vice chancellor, as a leader of a university. How much decisions are made by you in order to make things easier and in order to you know support these these issues? Because sometimes it says that what is required of us to grow as professionally uh, is the number of publications and not the quality of publications. So what could be the role of Vice Chancellor and is HEC, I'm being a little naughty here, is HEC making any control on autonomy of the universities or not? I think the, um, the answer is uh, yes on both counts. Um, HEC does have, uh, I mean I think uh, this business of um, metrics that are kind of centrally controlled are obviously a bit of a problem. I wish HEC had a accreditation system outside HEC because regulation and accreditation are two different things. Also, I think uh, the problem is not just HEC so much as our culture. Now, you can't fire people in this country. I mean, you know, that's a big problem. I mean, everywhere people now seem to have a sense of security. I'm here for a lifetime period. I got a government job, I'm here for a lifetime. Um, so that's a big problem. We have to get people to understand the sense of risk. Okay, you know, hey, if you don't perform, you're out, period. No, nobody, uh, you know, cares. Second, I think people have also fallen into a comfort. It's all a culture thing. It's not so much HEC. People have fallen into a comfort zone. Okay, yeah, I've got the old notes that I got in my PhD. I'm going to teach them now, and I'm not going to improve. So that's a big problem. Um, this, uh, uh, as I said, they, because we've started measuring these things too much, courses, for example, I don't know, I keep asking these guys, why do we have so many courses? When I came in, we had a hundred and something course, courses, 150 courses, I don't know what the hell, so I cut them down, now we've got 50, but even 50, there's a pressure to increase the courses, and then there are so many meetings, that, that's again, I know HEC developed a law which we passed, and these laws are crazy. I mean, there's so many meetings, board of studies and syndicate and this and that. We're a small outfit. Why do we need such a huge enterprise? Why do we do this? I mean, the American University runs with four or five trustees. Why do we have, I mean, we've got four secretaries on our board, we've got four provincial secretaries on our board, on our senate or whatever, and we've got nominee of the court, we've got a nominee of the parliament. This, I mean, how do you run a university like that? You know, so it's bizarre. Out there, they just have trustees and that's it, and the system runs. So all kinds of problems here, but this is so not so much HEC. Some HEC, yes. I mean, this model law that you have for university should go. It's period now. University need a charter. They don't need a law. They need a charter. But if you write so many things in the law, then you hamstring the university. So you don't want to do that. So there are tons of difficulties. Many of them culture. Many of them HEC. But um, I think we really need to think innovatively. I mean, everybody talks about solutions for a startup. Everybody talks about creative destruction. But in this system, we have no creative destruction. So if you don't have any creative destruction, we are lost. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, one question which I uh, noted from the uh, comments that uh, Dr. Idris made was mainly about uh, um, the, the need for moving into commercialization and how much of the research needs to be commercialized and who decides what do we research about. Um, so, and Dr. Sab also mentioned that it's only in Pakistan where, um, you know, sort of we, um, the university research is not uh, funded. So, PhD scholars have to pay for their own fee. Uh, but I, I mean, as much as I understand, I think English universities, I'm not talking about the other parts, so Scottish universities do cover for the fee, but English universities do charge fee from the PhD scholars. So, they do pay for, for themselves to do a PhD. However, when they are working on a research proposal, this research proposal <coughs> needs to be aligned with the university's research <coughs> priorities. So, um, could you, uh, Dr. Zain, shed some light on other international, uh, you know, sort of ways in which the research, who sets the research agenda for our, our, our universities? How would we do that? What will be the best way to go about it? So, before I go into answering this specific question, actually, I can just uh, relate some of my own experiences. So, when I joined, actually, HEC, uh, whatever thing, uh, I think it's okay. all right. So, so uh, and I saw some of our existing policies that we were implementing in our research grants actually. And I asked my staff actually that this is not in line with the international best practice. And they said that, yeah, this is what you have. If you really want to change, you have to revise the policy. You have to go to the commission and get it approved. 
and that's a long cycle so either you implement it as it is or you um, so what I did was that I actually started revising our policies actually. and I can fairly t tell you right now that all of our new research grant initiatives they are based on practices that are actually in line with the international best practices. So for instance uh, in all of our research grants you can actually build your PhD students stipend and we have raised the stipend level for 25,000 to a uh, window between 40 to 60,000. Okay. So that means that now your PhD student will have the right incentive to do full-time research. They will not be working on for as part time because I I think I don't believe that anybody can do research while they are working full time as a teacher. So it's not possible. So that's what we have built in in all of our research grants. And we have also actually got approval from the commission to build another program which we call university led research program. And that <coughs> program, will, we are right now developing the SOPs for that. It will be rolled out to all the public sector universities, where the universities will have to generate funds. Actually, they are already they already get the funding from the university from the HEC. Actually, they will use those funds in order to support their own research initiatives. Actually, and by when I say research initiatives, so that me includes the research funding for the uh, graduate students as well. So these things are already being implemented and of course you will see the results of, uh, out of these. Uh, now uh, going back to your question about the commercialization aspect. So when we talk about commercialization, it does not have to be that you are producing a commercial product at the end of the day. It could be a policy paper. It could be something that can benefit the rest of the society. So it does not have to be a product that you sell and you generate revenue out of it. It could be anything that can uh, signify the importance that you're doing in relation to the surroundings that where you are surviving. It could be a policy document, it could be a policy related initiative, anything around that. Actually. So that's what we mean by commercialization. And in that aspect actually, Oryx have a room to play in order to connect the researchers with their respective <coughs> organizations where there is a need for that input. So that's I think uh, where I see that Oryx needs to be placed. And I can just tell you that we are also revising the policy for Oryx as well. So it will be hopefully uh, presented in the commission meeting next uh, month actually. And <coughs> you will see some uh, improvements there. Thank you, Dr. So there are some comments. Uh, sir, please, would you like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? I'd like to make a few comments. Of course. Sorry, if I may. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I had something to do with the HEC. When the President Musharraf set up an eight-member committee, a steering committee to, re to reform higher education, the HEC grew out of that, was born out of that. Uh, but one of my recommendations there, in fact, is I have two major recommendations. You cannot have a focus on research without first focusing on good teaching. Teachers are the long pole in the tent of education. And we have a problem now with 200, nearly 200 universities that hop, teach, hop syndrome. Nobody gives full time. People want to do research, as you said, impact, impact factors, publications. And by the way, this is not only confined to Pakistan. I was in Oxford last year. I gave a talk there. And this was on the expectation crisis in the modern university. And they had the same problem. When I was there as an undergraduate, only 8% people, students, were engaged in research or postgraduate work. Now it's 52%. And the students were complaining that faculty don't, doesn't have time to teach us. They would like university industrial linkages, especially in the sciences and so but they have a lot of other problems. So uh, I'd like to say one thing. Uh, already pointed out, 
Commercialization and economic outcomes should not be the goal of a university. This can happen. Uh, there's one other area where I tried very hard and I've been fighting for the last 15 years, you know, nothing has happened. We made a terrible mistake separating medicine and engineering from general <coughs> universities. The scientists in a university like QAU, I know that very well, this university because I'm in Islamabad, are deprived of good workshops, good design facilities. The engineers are deprived of good sciences, basic sciences. The doctors, see a doctor, hospital university now for God's sake. They don't have access to good microbiology, molecular biology, biochemistry and so on. <coughs> Why? Uh, Social sciences pointed out, yes, major neglect. And if we had a, a really proper university with universal access uh, in terms of subjects and fields, it would civilize the scientists and engineers also, and at least the two communities, social and physical sciences, could communicate. Funding. There's one major source of fund lying untapped in Pakistan, the ICT R&D fund. And the government always tried to control it. But wherever little, and I think uh, people have got money from there, <coughs> some very interesting things have come out. You know that Pakistan's first ECG machine is ready for production, locally designed, locally software, hardware, everything. You know, then so many things are happening. But basically, the uh, mediocrity trap we talked about, this is an issue. And <coughs> one other major issue is about language. The medium of instruction is a major obstacle to good teaching and good research. And now with the internet, people can cut and paste things. They can't even read what they've written now. So they, there are other crises also here. <coughs> but ultimately, you cannot have good universities, good outcomes, unless your basic education is sound, is reasonable. We can't have three or four different systems operating in the same country. Uh, I'll just share something with you. Sorry, two little things. One uh, talked about university industrial leakages. I've done 28 billion rupees of production. This is the outcome of the research and the things I had designed. Exports to Switzerland, Germany, and Spain, Malaysia, Bangladesh. And it just grew because we had a good team. We had the equipment. Now, equipment is another issue. You have lots of equipment in universities, no maintenance. Please believe me. I've been to one or two universities, I got down on the floor and repaired their instruments. Data is the You've got major university equipment I saw this is for designing microchips at UT the what? Locked up in there mirror, give me bandhani hai. So, <coughs> ICT R&D fund, I think is about four to five hundred million dollars worth of money. Rupees. Million rupees? It's yeah. four to five billion rupees. Yeah. At one time we charged twenty billion also. Mm -hmm. I know this because Mr. Galani, the former Prime Minister, wanted to get hold of it and use it for mm -hmm. other activities. But that's the area to tackle. There's also export development fund. Yes. Export development So, we, we are talking with them. Yeah. <coughs> okay, gee, uh, just uh, let's. Uh, I hope we get out of this low output, low productivity, and low expectation strength. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Any other? There's one more comment, Dr. Do you want to? Yes, make please, if I may. Yeah. Uh, let me also introduce myself. I'm a retired uh, teacher um, and a researcher who uh, decided to get out of the system because the system would not support my research. Uh, and because I wanted answers to questions that did not appeal to people who were uh, managing things. Now, uh, having said that, I have, <coughs> I join most of you in the complaints that you have from the system. But more than any of those things, I would like to uh, get to a comment that uh, Dr. 
Nadeem has been making. He made it twice, but he did not follow it up. And I think that that is where the problem really lies. It is the culture that we are, uh, um, we have a problem with. And, uh, sir, I would like to suggest to you that international best practices are all very well, but they do not work in our culture. We need somebody to have a proactive attitude to understanding what makes my mind work. The people who enter the education system are most of them joining us for a job. They're not joining us to teach. They're not joining us to research. And we are doing nothing to make them think that that is what they're here for. <coughs> Whether you can fire them or not, <coughs> we can't inspire them. I gave up my last job, which was uh, director of the, the National Institute of Historical and Cultural Research, because I could not inspire my team. I had some time in my term, and I gave it up. I have been a professional retirer. I've given up three jobs <laughs> because... Only three, yes? Yes, only three. But that's the number of jobs I was uh, at liberty to take in the time that I had. So, and all because I realized that I could not deliver what I was in the system for. Now, there is a lot that is wrong with the system, but whatever is wrong is more wrong with the people who are running the system and the people who are joining the system. I don't know how to inspire these young people who are listening to us. But if you people are still going to sit in these chairs, you better find a way of inspiring them. <clears throat> the other day I was here for another seminar and I abstained from talking because there also I wanted to ask about the emperor's new clothes. <laughs> who is the proactive one? Who is the person who is going to move things? We all know that there are problems with the system, but they have to be resolved. And if you want your hot seat, please find a way of doing that. <coughs> Thank you. Sir, if you just permit me. Uh, please don't run down the National Institute of Historical and Cultural Research. <laughs> no, I'll tell you why. I'm, running, I'm not running it down. I said I could you not could inspire. inspire. I'll tell you what. <laughs> About 15, 20 years ago, I had some old <laughs> documents with me. The Comrade, 1913, six months. I had many more, but they got lost over the years. But the papers are going bad. So through a friend, I sent them to the Institute. They said, do you allow us to photocopy? I said, please do that. So they sorted, cleaned up by the, that, those set of documents, you know, and preserved them for me. And I'm saying this because the, the Imam Bukhari Center is set up now in uh, uh, Uzbekistan. They have a treasure trove of manuscripts, and they're looking for partners. And I was, I've tried very hard in Pakistan. Nobody's been able to fakir as and others. No one would help me. They want them preserved translated and so on, so there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah. So, so last Thank thing, you. I'm talking about industrial <coughs> industry and so on. Do you know that one Pakistani manufacturer has 10% or more of the tripod marketing issue in the European Union? Listen. There's a question at the back, and then we will, uh, I think, three questions, and then we will come to uh, the next set of questions and before I ask the panel to respond. I am coming from the think tank by the name of Islamabad Islam Research Institute. And I am a retired brigadier from Pakistan Army. And I studied in a Korean National Defense University, so in that backdrop, a few comments and a question. The British Council did some wonderful job, but unfortunately, this, our old colonial master did not left the research culture in Pakistan. History is the best example. The 
in when HEC was made, I remain a director of finance of the university for three years in that background I'm talking. The main focus was on natural sciences. Whatever the criteria, the funding criteria, the TTS was made, that was made on the natural sciences. Pakistan now needs social scientists, a good quality social scientists and role model social scientists. The Korean Institute of Development Economics was made on the model of Kai. Where is no Kai and where is Kai? I, Dr. Nadim is doing a wonderful job and trying to revive the old glory of Kai. And this is why the first time I was just coming down here where so many wonderful names were the VCs of Kai and Kai has a prestige. I am Maybe my presumptions are wrong. I pray. Few, twen 20 years back, the Islamabad College for Boys was one of the best institutions. Our government institution was the best. But now they have to compete with the Beacon House, the Roots, the Punjab College. Now the public sector schools cannot match them. <coughs> and the threshold difference whatever the asymmetrical education difference is, they cannot compete our uh, secondary education system. In the same way, after some time I've worried that tertiary education is the same thing. So please do something and you need to revive the TTS system for the professors. The, the, to me the flawed, the flawed was that to produce more PhD. Now in the job market, the PhD, fresh PhD, the China is producing so many PhD, Pakistani PhDs and they are not getting the job. Same way we have to raise the bar for our research. Private sector is ready to... I have, there are around 100 think tanks in Pakistan. The private sector is ready to uh, feed in, but unfortunately, the HEC, uh, um, sorry for harsh words, HEC is also working in silos. Each director, each, there is no centralized body who is looking on all the whole framework, whatever our desires, whatever goals, whatever our objectives are. So please make some social scientist role models for Pakistan and inculcate research culture in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. There's one more comment from the first. Rosa Raghav, my partner, please. Thank you so much. And then we will be discussing the time. I request your comments, sir. Please, please. Well, my name is Sanjeev Kahe. I have come here to get things about the culture of research. I didn't really want to ask any questions. I was excited by the comment towards the end because we started talking about culture of research only towards the end. Of course, Nadeem referred to it in his usual negative style, but that is our culture, okay? <coughs> when HEC was being formed and the I thought it was the HEC committee, but he became... I am talking about the government, the chairman, the chief, the first attending the CTWP and other authorities. You see, it was all science in the beginning. And I had to say at one point in one of the meetings that science without social science leads to fascism. And then the emphasis was on uh, building new universities and so on. And it was very hard for me to convince that faculty should be the priority. And only then this faculty program started, which again degenerated into what uh, what I think he himself described as PhDization. Now culture is a very serious matter. What is culture? The simplest definition is cultivation of mind 
not idea. And that is what leads to. I mean, <coughs> we don't even talk about ideas. We don't even discuss ideas. We just start doing something. We have data and blah, blah. And, you know, I think you are new to HEC. My impression is, an honest impression, that you are being incremental. You are doing more of the same, depending on the length of your purse. And the length of uh, the purse reminds me of the question that the Greek raised. Is it uh, out of school children or... You know, ever <coughs> since, ever since HEC right, started functioning, the allocation for primary education has become stagnant. This is also something uh, to worry about. But coming back to culture, you see, research for the sake of research is also very important. That is basic research. I think you raised the uh, point. But research linked with something towards some objective. You know, you really have to create systems to do it. It won't just happen. And it won't happen if you start hiring and firing people that you won't be able to do anything. In this country, you have to think about it. You, you, you look at what is happening now. You see, as the prices uh, increase for the first time in this country, everybody, there is a lot of research that suggests that a few things can be done to avoid this crisis. But no. And now, the same utility store, which they wanted to privatize in the beginning, is now uh, in the forefront of the uh, firefighting. What I'm saying is, research, for the sake of research, is important. Research <coughs> with something profitably is also important. But the culture of research is much more important. And that is, you know, uh, enlightened teaching, creative teachers, leaders of research, and not just paper publishing or whatever. And that happens, you know, I think I began here, you know, uh, five. A lot of good research, but government ignored it. And that is when, uh, and that was before the formation of Bangladesh. And you should know, <coughs> you should know that research done at five actually led to Bangladesh. Why? People had a problem, they, they kept thinking about it, nobody bothered them, they were doing their research, and it was used. So Pyth has, has actually done research with led to something. Now I'm using it as an example of independent research, serious research, and non-interference in the process of research. And these are problems of culture. So I come back to what I said in the beginning. Cultivation of mind for ideas. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Saab, uh, we are um, uh, running out of time. Um, I, would you like to make a consolidated response to the comments made from the floor? Um, and then we'll I think that the comments are well taken. And uh, yes, of course, if there are any comments, we'll talk about them and we are going to discuss this. This is what I mean by research conversation. Culture is a research conversation. Sorry. Um, I think what we need to, uh, is a research conversation. Research must be a conversation, it must not be projects and papers. And we must, conversation happens like this. That's why I encourage AGC to develop seminars, conferences, etc. But let's not count conferences as you know, trying to get big names. I've done that too, and it's meaningless. Let's just try and get a conversation going through seminars, through simple things, no ceremonies. In fact, when I have a conference, I hate to invite ministers or something because, you know, they just come in, um, you know, do nothing. So we have conferences for learning. And why yeah. So yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and, uh,
don't know. If anybody else wants to say anything, please. Uh, and, and we, Dr. Saab, would you like to make any response and the final comments before? I think it was, uh, for me, it was a very learning experience to be here actually today with so many eminent personalities actually. Um, I, I would take it uh, all of, I have taken all of the notes that have been uh, said here actually and uh, I am, but I can uh, assure you that we are going to work on these ideas actually. So, I mean the thing that uh, we have uh, just presented today, these are just the first step towards a long journey actually. So, and I think I totally agree with that we need to cultivate the concept of research culture and that cannot happen in isolation again. So right now we are just taking some initial steps that will lead to uh, achieving our end objective. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Zain. If you permit me, uh, this gentleman from the armed forces reminds me of something else. How can you have an academic head of a university, head of a university, who is not an academic? How can he understand, even uh, know what research are the, the, I mean, the problem is that the HEC does not appoint a vice master. <laughs> so that's the problem. <laughs> there is not the uh, administrative post be for the HEC. There is a few more uh, hands raising from the back, but uh, unfortunately we are really short of time. And I think this I mean, discussion uh, sorry, is a starting point. Say, We've got some tea arranged for yes. you upstairs, so and uh, it's a beautiful scenario to have a discussion. So please feel free to join us there and have a discussion. I think we can talk about a lot of things. Before you break, can I make a quick comment that more changes, improvement that you want to bring will not happen. You talk about mindset and the culture. That is to be done at much earlier stage when the human development takes place at the school level. That's number two. If you don't have the change in criteria for appointment, for promotion, for civil award, for academy of science,